have a few different people. Specifically, this is an excellent uh, lead-in. It's like we thought about it. Uh, this is an excellent lead-in into the idea of talking about one of the largest challenges uh, that uh, a number of us who have been working in, in, these, uh, in these forums have, uh, have run into is like, what is the infrastructure? What is the actual spaces? How do we work in these spaces? And how do, uh, how, uh, how do we solve those challenges? Because um, not all of us have the opportunity to build something new. Sometimes, very often, it's just working in individual spaces. Uh, I know that uh, one of the experiences that we had with, a, of our, with our first Toaster Lab project, when we did our project, the, Festi uh, the Future of Storytelling Festival, none of us involved with the project could be on site during the actual festival that it ran out. We got it set up, we went ahead of time, we got everything set up, and we tried to document it as much as possible, but um, something that is phone-based, out of doors, is using GPS, what do you, what do you show <laughs> to have somebody understand that they should interact with it? Um, and that, on the subject, like, if someone's keeping a, a running list, that's one of our failures as Toaster Lab. Uh, since then, it's always been about how do we have somebody there as the guide that can at least get you started with what's going, even if you feel confident in using the technology once it's there. How do you cross that threshold with somebody? Uh, so for our conversation that will lead us up to lunch, we'll, we'll lead up to right before uh, noon, if you would mind staying. Uh, I'm also going to ask uh, Tan, can you come up, come up to the stage, please? Um, we'll, we'll come over here uh, to our, our panel setup here. Uh, and also, uh, Bernard, can you come up to the stage, please? There you, there you are. So I'll stay off to the side here. Uh, Patrick has already had a, a lovely introduction here uh, as well and has uh, kicked off our conversation here. Uh, Bernard Reich is from, uh, well, who came up in the presentation earlier, uh, is uh, associate professor at Simon Fraser University uh, in the School of Interactive, uh, <laughs> what? Science. 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 Yes. Uh, uh, you're a psychophysicist uh, working in cognitive science around uh, human multimodal spatial cognition, spatial orientation, self-motivation, perception, many other things that I'm like, I want to know more about that because I'm not entirely sure what all of those are, but are things that I know are important to the types of way that we're thinking and runs the iSpace lab over there. And Tayana Chen is an interdisciplinary writer, uh, media artist, coming from, well, Hamilton, but uh, is a colleague of mine also at York University in the School of Arts, Media, Performance, and uh, Design, uh, who will be presenting actually specifically on her work within uh, our panel, uh, our third panel of the day around research creation, but is also joining us now because she recently launched an exploratory space at York uh, called Beta Space, which is about bringing in undergraduate, undergraduate students to have a research space to start working with these technologies. So we're gonna have a conversation about infrastructure. Oh boy. I know. <laughs> uh, so uh, would it, uh, where it would be good to start, because I, I, I mentioned each of the spaces, and Patrick, you, I, I don't know if you wanna mention another space uh, that you'd be using as well. Um, but the first question I had for you is, can you talk a little bit about like the spaces in which you're working when you're trying to build out whether or not it's a laboratory or an exploratory space? Um, what are these spaces that you've been working in? Both what, what did they start as? And how did you bring things into them? Do you want to do rock, paper, scissors? One, two, oh, three. You just go. Oh, you go. No, 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 Patrick secretly wants to start. Oh. Okay, exactly. <laughs> All right, so uh, cool. the image here is of a hangar space at the Center for Digital Media, which is on Great Northern North Campus. Uh, and it is co-owned by four universities. Uh, that's the first thing to juggle in your brain. Uh, what that means is that there are a lot of hoops to jump through to put on an event like this, uh, and uh, including, do I want alcohol? Probably not, um, in, in this particular case, which allowed us to bypass certain licenses, which was a really good, and insurance, as many of us know, when we produce with uh, alcohol in, in mind. Um, the space itself, the infrastructure, you can see the grid above. Um, I think this grid could take more weight, just to give you an idea. The space itself 
uh, was not really created to stage events. It became possible because of the vastness of the space and the modularity of it. It's predominantly used as a teaching space because that's the main activity that occurs in the Master of Digital Media program in its use of this hangar. Uh, however, there have been events there. So when events are, are co-produced or co-created with, with different types of partnerships, uh, Yangos and Marco just did uh, uh, Recto VRSO there, and that was another lovely use of the hangar in terms of mixed reality. Uh, again, we all had to deal with the constraints that it's not really a space set up for the type of staging that I think many of us in theater are used to, nor can it handle the rigor. So including electric, in, um, including weight bearing, including uh, lighting. So all of those things had to be considered in terms of the infrastructure. But the awesome thing is that because this was the, the Carnival of Mixed Reality was part of a course, then I was allowed to use it and allowed to occupy the space along with others for a long period of time. Key, that long period, of, that stretch of three weeks, essential, right? It allowed us to go in there and do a lot of, uh, a lot of moving around of movable walls. Where are we gonna set stuff up? All of those things were important, right? So in terms of that infrastructure, extremely lucky, but it has to be related to curriculum. Yes, so I think this is fabulous. I haven't seen this um, before, and it, I, three weeks you did this in, this whole setup? Yeah. Wow, that's, yeah, that's amazing. So, um, so beta space is, we, we're just starting it actually. So when you're talking about starting up, uh, we just got funding in the summer and we're just building it up. Um, we have a space in the basement of the, uh, the arts building at York, uh, and it's about, uh, twice the size, I think, right? Mm -hmm. And it used to be theaters, actually, yeah. right? But mm -hmm. I'm actually in cinema and media arts, so I'm not in theater. Uh, we are in this, like, the, the art school, but, uh, and I don't know what it is like here, but um, there's often these silos, right, between departments that, um, no, no? no. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing, because there are, in, in our, <laughs> um, but, you know, part of the, um, what we're trying to do is sort of break these silos open, right? So we're like, yeah, we're media arts, um, and Ian is in theater, and I know dance also does a lot of VR mm -hmm. work, and, and I'd really love to like bring, you know, people doing media and mixed reality performances, and you know, because we consider this is like expanded cinema, right? So there's mm -hmm. all these different terms for it. So we call it expanded cinema mm. because that is because we're in cinema, but it is, you know. <laughs> building out toward the, the same kind of works. Um, and we don't have any of this kind of setup right now. Um, so part of our infrastructure is like, okay, I think that we do need to work more in this way where we consider the experience, we consider lighting, we don't have any of that yet. Mm -hmm. Right now we're just trying to build up like, oh, um, equipment, right? What mm -hmm. equipment are we gonna buy? And as you were saying, it does need to be tied to curriculum. So um, that's one of the challenges is Okay, so we have like a media arts course, but how do we make it interdisciplinary? How do, we, how do I get students from other departments to come and collaborate, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole idea of beta space is like um, this uh, media arts incubator that can um, get undergrad students to you know, collaborate with each other and bring their own discipline strengths. Um, but that's proving right now, it, you know, within the university, it's like, well, how do dance students in their fourth year, how do they sign up for it? Because we don't have a course code for it. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we, can we do it? Are they all independent studies now? You know, how do we, how do we grade them all between these, you know? So this is like one of the, uh, the hurdles that we're just trying to surmount right now. Um, do you integrate with uh, organizations or nonprofits as well, or, and artists? Um, we don't right now because it's, as we say, we're just starting out, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we, we can't even figure out how to collaborate within departments. Mm -hmm. Never mind trying mm -hmm. to branch it Go out. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but that would be a great thing because the so the entire idea of beta space is to bring something from idea conception to beta release, right? So whatever form that is, mm -hmm. whether it's exhibition or a platform or um, selling something on Steam, which is like another possible way. Mm -hmm. um, 
so we're just trying to like work work through all these these siloed problems of how to work interdisciplinary, um, and it's it's pretty difficult yeah. <laughs> so far. Yeah, there's lots of structural issues. There's a lot of structural. I, I think that's, that's part and parcel with uh, university. Um, mm. Let's keep going with spaces first, because I have questions of, of talking about those. Because one of the key things that somebody might be uh, might be wondering at this point too is um, what happens when you're not at a university. And we, I will ask that question in a moment. But first, I uh, can talk a little bit uh, about the lab space that you have at SFU. The lab space, or lack thereof, something. Yeah. So uh, we, we don't have a, like a dedicated large uh, hangar uh, mm -hmm. there. So most of our labs are just flexible use spaces. Mm -hmm. And so they're used for research projects, teaching spaces. We don't really have like a dedicated immersive MR, whatever, teaching space. So uh, when I started teaching our immersive environments course uh, before Oculus existed, uh, so uh, the first part is, OK, do we even have a computer lab that can handle uh, this kind of stuff? So we had to find ways to uh, equip at least one of the computer labs with fast enough computers and graphics cards so you could actually do that. Mm -hmm. And then where do you do the showcase? And uh, so we don't have a dedicated showcase space, but we have the mezzanine, which is kind of like an open space where a lot of people walk through. And it's nice and large. And if you uh, ask early enough, you can basically re uh, get it reserved. But there's not necessarily internet connectivity or wired internet or even getting power there. So, so there's so many challenges then. And how do you get the computers from the labs into there if they're tied to the uh, desks? So th there's a lot of uh, interesting challenges uh, there to do. So I want to show some images of that mezzanine. Uh, sure. Yeah, you can just. And the work that you and I did. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. You can just go, go to the website or whatever. Yeah, and uh, so uh, with Patrick together, uh, we co-taught co -taught and designed a new 15-credit course, uh, which we called a Semester on Alternate Realities, where uh, we really asked students to embrace uh, the agile process and really uh, create, co-create in teams and in, in larger teams in the whole class, even uh, different experiences using immersive environments uh, to create meaningful, positive experiences there. Um, OK, I'll just keep talking. Yeah, well, it, well, it's coming up. Or, uh, well, actually, or you can I, just ask like, the next question. Yeah. Sorry, my next question was sort of like, what are the key challenges of, of, of bringing somebody into those spaces? Like, what you started highlighting some of those in terms of like the infrastructural challenges there. But I think that those are common across a lot of different spaces as well. Yeah. Talked a little bit about the structural systems and grids, power, connectivity, all of those sort of things. Well, the other aspect is really the user experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you walk into a theater space, you have a certain expectation that something's going to be different because it looks like a theater and we have this convention, okay, this is different. Now, if you repurpose a space, then you somehow need to even create this expectation, this priming, and how, how do you even do that, especially if it's a very public space like we use for our showcases? Mm -hmm. How do you get the, the audience to even want to engage with those experiences, uh, if, especially if it's just a one-off event and it's not like a large conference where you sign up for. Mm -hmm. So how do we even prime these? Oh, okay, there's some of the examples. So often we ask people to, okay, really at least try and think of the user experience. The other thing is, I mean, especially if you want people to have a, a, a deeper experience, you, you cannot just let them be there openly and everybody else watches them. You cannot have a private uh, experiences in public, so you need to, mm -hmm create a physical, safer space so they can have a virtual, safer experience. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with starting up beta space, uh, Tain, mm -hmm. how, how, is, how has that gone? Because it's only been a matter of months that it's it been open. It has only been a matter what of are, months. What have been some of those like, <laughs> surprises that you've run into the, with, the, with the opening jitters? Um, well... It's funny because you, you just mentioned um, movable walls, mm -hmm. and th actually that's one of the main things that mm -hmm. I've discovered that we need <laughs> are movable walls, right? Um, so we just bought like a couple, and I, I was just looking at that, and I was like, yeah, we need to get a lot more <laughs> movable walls. It's so, you know, to create like these private spaces, because yeah. we wheels. have like this get on wheels, wheels yeah. yes, <laughs> just be able to move things around. So. So we did have like our initial um, opening showcase, and that really helped, was just to have a couple of those walls to build like these private spaces. <laughs> but really envisioning the space, how could it be, um, has mm -hmm. been a large part of just working toward, because we want to make the space um, you know, usable in many different ways, because it's teaching, um, 
prototyping and then exhibition, right? And, and as you're saying, like that's one of the main things. Yeah, like no one's going to see it if we don't have a good exhibition yeah, space. Yeah, and I think the flexibility in the space is yeah. really almost the most important thing because you don't, don't exactly know what will work or will not work and what will collapse and yeah. what might not. So flexibility in yeah. imagining what the space could be and then just building the infrastructure to be able to address the many, many different kind the needs of it. You know, because some of our students, they don't only do augmented reality, they also just do straight video, mm -hmm. interactive video, um, and then more of these uh, performance type things as well. So and all of it has to go into this one space like this. So it's really great to see how you, you're Yeah, I mean, this is you use all kinds of uh, events, including gala dinners and addresses and wow. concerts and so on. So yeah. th there's no pre-expectation what you can turn it into. So you have to really work and create that uh, experience. Yeah, amazing. Well, within one day, because that's the maximum you can book it for. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So that's one thing with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Four? Yeah. Four? Yeah. Four? yeah, so oh, much five, work. Five, five, oh, you. my God. So you sort of scale what you're able to do based into the available time that you have, yeah. getting back to that sort of a three-week idea. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. I know that one of the issues that we run into on the thinker side at, at York whenever we're trying to install something is just like the, the the limitations of actually working in the space too. There's a user experience for the person coming into it, but there's a user experience for the person actually installing it. Yeah. So you know we're having a conversation now because of uh, any set of things that there's there's some new campus there's like a York is is invested in a new campus space which in which there will be pr production space and. Uh, like there's been a fight to keep the ceilings low enough that somebody can work on them from ladders so that there's not the regulations that go into mm. now we have to train everybody to work on a lift um, because I'm, of the I'm height. Of the, yes. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, and sometimes the people designing the spaces don't necessarily, like, they just don't think about that aspect mm. of it that it's like actually if I put this ceiling height at 18 feet and we have a bunch of spaces in theater that are 18 feet because that's the size of the our studio black box, mm -hmm. and so they put everything else at 18 feet, but then it took years of figuring out how we can actually work in that space without just having somebody babysit students within mm -hmm. the labor setup of, of, of that sp our specific milieu. And so, like, what does it mean when you go, like, 10 feet up, 12 feet up, both in terms of time and then infrastructure? Was that something that in this, how did that play out in the hangar? Because you've got these scaffoldings. I don't know what you're talking about. All right, well, then I forget <laughs> yeah. that I even asked that. There were no safety issues. Right, there were no that safety issues. That was not a Russian was. student on a scaffolding without his safety. <laughs> I just, just to be clear. No, no, he, he, he just flew in from Russia and accidentally <laughs> went up there uh, before you could check. Yeah, there, there was only, you. I mean, in order to get on a lift, that was one person. Right. And that was Josh, who I didn't mention yet, who actually acted in all those capacities that I was trying to, like, he, he I mean, in a lot of ways, but he was new to, to theater, as we discovered when, when he was trying to, to help in other capacities, but, at, but he had a license to go up on a lift. He was insured. You know, the, all those things have to be taken into account, especially in a space that size. Right. Uh, we had, in what unfortunately we didn't capture in any shots, was a student team that Bernard and I worked sure. with, and they were, they, one of the students, they, they told us that they were an experienced carpenter, and we believed them. <laughs> <laughs> Mistakes are made, right? Especially when a Nobody plywood got killed wall. Or hurt. What, hmm? Nobody got killed or hurt. No one got killed or hurt when the giant plywood wall came crashing down half an hour before go time. Those things have to be considered. A life in the theater. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, I, um, I, but it's, I think it really contributed to the student learning and that they realized, okay, we really need to well, work with what happens safe. and Lots improvise there, and Bernard. learn from it on the moment. <laughs> What does it take to get a license to go on a lift? Connor? It's a day. <laughs> it's a day. I do. Certification location? Oh, it's not bad. Yeah. yeah. It's the money. <laughs> We've, we, because uh, we can't work in our theater spaces without it, it's been built into the curriculum at York to okay. do to the minister. So they end up with a Ministry of Labor Ontario approved lift ticket because otherwise we, we, they couldn't actually do the work. That's for it. Uh, for a while, we used to do it where we had faculty. I was trained as a trainer in Ontario, so 
Uh, to, no. I'm not. That is that is expired. <laughs> no. I have a current lift ticket, but I'm no longer trained as a jet. No longer signed up as a trainer. But that was like it took my entire time that I've been faculty at York, which has been seven years of like trying to figure out. Once the ministry said like this is how you have to do it, to actually build out like how do we actually absorb this? How do we absorb anything new into the way that we that that we teach for it? Uh, and all these things become invisible because it's like, I want to track people in a large amount of space. I need something that has a high point of view. Well, now I'm, now I'm in a lift. And now I've added the hours of, of doing that sort of thing. Um, I, yeah, go ahead. Well I, well, I had a question because we're talking about infrastructure and, and that's all good internally. And, you know, we mainly deal with uh, the issues that are, uh, that come to us through universities and, and the training mm -hmm. and the learning, the research. Small Stage is a company that we wanted to have come in for a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, Kendra's got a company, uh, we'd love to have her come in for a period of time. Those are, I think, some of the challenges that, that uh, I'm facing moving forward. I want to have that. And I wonder and that, Yeah, I wonder that's if my that big question. No, well, no, that, right? that was the question because we've talked a lot about working in university spaces, which are both regulated but also resourced in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and there are benefits to that, there are challenges to that. But then, you know, wanting to make this work usable, either whether it's students once they leave, or uh, any of us maintaining work outside of the university setting, or for those who are interested in it, how do we get this, these considerations and this learning off campus? Good question. You're thinking about it, <laughs> yeah. One thing that, that came to mind when you said that is, uh, what I've experienced commonly in mixed reality events of any type, on any scale, is that there's, there's generally a lack of presence, unless it's, a, unless it's a production company that's hired to manage all of this, right? And to set all of this up. There's generally a lack of uh, stage crafters present. And that, I think, is a, is a compelling story to tell. Because I think there's a, there, there still is in the, a lot in the ecosystem of uh, software development, there's a misperception somehow of theater practitioners and what they can bring to the table. And that needs to, that needs to change. Because can you talk a little bit more about well, what those misconceptions well, are? I mean, some of the misconceptions are, oh, it's theater and, there, and there's, kind of a, there's kind of a bias. It, it, that theater is, you know, it's... Okay, I'll, I'll give you some words that I heard in meetings that I shall not name names. Oh, kind of flaky, kind of disorganized. Like they have no idea about how rigorous staging is in our disciplines. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think that is a story that needs to be told and retold. So that when Julianne comes in with small stage and Lisa and a bunch of dancers, that students know as well, right, we can learn from them. And that's one of the challenges that I face persistently, right? Because there are lessons that, that there, there's life, there's professional experience, and there's this idea of staging that it seems to be a concept that, that flies over the head of a lot of events that I've seen. Hmm. There's not really, there, I've been to events where, like, why did you tape that down, that wire? I don't understand why you taped that down. Can, can you tell me why that's taped down? Like, even thinking like that, right? How are we taking care, again, of our audiences who are not used to this? And theater, uh, for me, has those practices. Not always, right? But the rigor is there in the training, at least. So. But, I mean, that's a typical thing that happens if different disciplines come together. Unless you already know enough about the other disciplines, it's often not appreciated what they can actually bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, in my department, we, we combine a lot of different disciplines I inherently. But I think it really takes some time and appreciation and also trust that, okay, they, I'm not sure exactly what the other people are good for, or for maybe. Mm. <laughs> but once you work with them, then you realize, like, wow, they're absolutely amazing <laughs> at that part that I have no idea of. I didn't even know it was important. Mm. But just even trusting that somebody from a different field can bring that to the table without necessarily knowing the details of, okay, why it's taped on there, but it, just kind of trusting. The pr they probably have a reason it's, they do it. Mm -hmm. and if I have time, I might ask if I'm really interested. If not, I'll just uh, let them do it. So we, we take things down in film as well. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, right? You have to take things in and film. But, so, but getting back to your the original question, which is how to get out of the academy, mm. and at least in cinema, there's a lot of, um, you know, film festivals that are um, branching out now into VR and mixed reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that, that there, I don't know if there's more exhibition opportunities in that sense. Maybe. Um, but, it, but there is a lot of exhibition, at least, opportunities uh, within uh, film festivals, mm -hmm. right? So... Well, Sundance and TIFF are doing things exactly. and imaginative, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so I'm not sure in the theater world, again, like the silos, right? Mm -hmm. um, what it's like. Um, but it, it is becoming more accepted in, in, in my field, anyways. Yeah, I want to... Oh, oh, sorry. Let's open it up to yeah. questions, and oh, I'll run the mic around. I was going to ask if uh, Yangos or Marco will speak oh, to... Yeah. To that because they've been involved. all the better for me to run the yeah. around. Mm -hmm. Did you? Well, well, the the idea of mixed reality entering the, the more of the discipline of film. Yeah. And I know you guys yeah. were involved. Yeah. The bigger, the bigger uh, international film festivals are really engaging uh, XR as a medium, and to design around XR experiences, you have to design the space as well. I think if it's, it has to be done the right way, so more and more uh, conferences are doing that. I think it's still a bit, they're still figuring out a bit out on how to do it. Some of them just put a couple of laptops uh, in a basement and think that that's going to do the trick, but that's not going to convince anyone to go there and, and check these experiences that are made with a whole bunch of love and effort uh, out. So, so it's, I think it's two these two disciplines that come together and trying to find out. And we yeah. see a lot of voids that can be filled, but um, it's not everyone is like willing to to approach this with a, with a bit of an open mindset of just like, oh, yeah, yeah, just, th th these laptops will do, right? Mm, that's true. I had, I had a student, actually, who just presented her VR work at Sundance, nice. and it was really well received, but she said that um, even within the topography of Sundance, all the ex installations were way out on, mm -hmm. on the margin. Yeah. So if you wanted to For go sure. to them, you had to go. That's marginal. It's marginal, <laughs> right? So they had Literally to go away mm. to, to go see that. Yeah. I did see that there was a, a VR experience in a pool at Sundance. Yeah. So it was for underwater, yeah. which was mm -hmm. pretty well, neat, right? On the, cool. on the other yeah. end, and I'll make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm moving so that I'm actually in light, <laughs> have an appreciation for stage craft. Um, that uh, the, a, a convening that, that, that we met at, I'm not going to name because I'm going to, to, to take them to task a little bit, but there were a number of VR films that were shown, mm -hmm. uh, and they were all on Oculus Go's, which are gray, mm -hmm. and it was in like a conferencing room, which was gray. They just sort of set out on a table with the lights on. And so they were really engaging experiences, but there wasn't a lot of sonography around like, how mm -hmm. do you come into that space? No. And if there wasn't somebody there to hold your hand and be like, put on this headset, then you would have just been like, oh, someone left a bunch of stuff in this room, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. There was a question right here. I have a question um, around sort of the staging of the actual AR film that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Is that the same for the design of, of that experience? And how that blends with the design of the physical space that you're going to experience that in? And if uh, there's a dialogue between the designers of the physical space and the design of to make it more of a unified experience. I think a lot of what we kind of talk about, and I look at this, it looks like it's easy. It doesn't look mm -hmm. like something that is going to be really riveting and exciting and immersive. Mm -hmm. I look, um, and, and so... Maybe, maybe bring up something from our showcase. I come from a teaching background, so I'm mm -hmm. kind of a theater and a teaching experience. So how do I get my students? Right, there's the thresholding question of how, how you actually get someone and to, also to, to do I think the best audience experience is when you don't even notice the technology. It's just all one unified experience. And the fun palace managed to do that through sort of the staging of the physical space and integrating it with the virtual. But how do we, is there, I guess, is there a method for this? They, well, it's, it's really yeah, caring about the user. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think there's like an accepted written down handbook of that. In essence, it's very simple. 
think about the user, walk their th uh, in their shoes, and really think from the beginning to the end. What happens when you enter the space or even hear about the event and so on. And if you have three weeks to set up something, then you can do a lot more than if you have two hours in the morning before uh, you have to start. Or, or if you have multiple months, that's completely different. But I think it's really thinking of every single moment in the uh, user experience is why do they even want to go in there? How do you transition in and out? What happens after the experience? Like one VR experience I tried that was probably the most powerful, there were like two post VR stages and rooms basically. And I need, really needed that time to really for everything mm -hmm. to sink in. So in a way, it's almost like theme parks uh, probably have it down the best because for them, mm. they have to handle more numbers, but they're, it, it, they design the whole experience from beginning to end and after what most people think is the end. And what's, what's what, interesting what? about bringing up theme parks too is that as I did uh, my, my graduate degree at, at CalArts, which is down outside of Los Angeles, and half the people I went to school with for theater and theater design are working in themed environment because of the storytelling and the wrapping around the user experience of how you tell the story yeah. through, even if you're not putting something yeah. on the I mean, stage. we literally just did some research to really try and investigate what really happens if you have a pre and post experience that's actually a lot longer than the actual VR experience, mm -hmm. and how does it change the user experience? Yeah. So what I would offer is like, um, as the last thing, observing a lot. I think we both have a lot of experience of putting people into headsets and seeing how they react. So if you're a student, I, I got that right, um, to, to teach them how to observe. There's a lot of stuff that you can just see when you put people that have never been in VR into a headset in all different sort of contexts. How do they feel, if they feel observed, if they feel isolated, and, and all these small little inhibitions that, that stop people of fully engaging with the content, I think are very important to design these experiences. So one thing is thinking about it, but then also actually observing because it's a bit of a difference sometimes what comes in. Can I, can I add something yeah, uh, to respond to Claudia's uh, question as well? One of the most powerful uh, experiences that I had uh, that engaged with multiple realities was in Toronto, uh, and Julianne will know Bill James and Peter Chin, who, and, uh, and, a, and a bunch of other creators, and we, they were in a site-specific location. And there was an opera singer on top of a mound of dirt with televisions flickering. So just so imagine that for a second. You walk in, <laughs> and the, the entire space, about twice the size of, of the hangar that you guys saw, um, very minimal lighting, beautiful piece, beautiful. And I think that we can also take advantage of the, the history of theater in site-specific spaces and to be able to, to look what can we take advantage of in the actual existing design and how can we manipulate that to what we want without radically transforming it or changing it because that's the limitation we have, right? Mm. And don't paint anything. Yeah. <laughs> I want to bring to a question about that here too. Actually, it's just a, a quick comment looking at the, the photos and what I'm seeing uh, in the display aspects. And it, it makes a lot of sense to me that when you're making re alternate realities that you want to think about the reality you're stepping into. But a lot of what I'm seeing could just be cleaned up by taking it right out of the trade show playbook. Um, and Sorry, can you repeat that last? The trade show play oh, playbook be, yeah, right. of yeah. uh, what you would see when you go to a conference what you'd, um, and looking at the layout um, and just having a, a head report on the specs of it in a booth uh, and clear, cleaning it up that way and then putting on the layer secondary. Mm -hmm. So just toss that out there and one more. Um, I'm thinking a lot about also how, yeah, how we avoid the bad habits of both forms um, because I think we also drift towards those in time, mm -hmm. right? That more and more of these events are like how many planning meetings go into the live stream versus the experience in the room and at what point is the live stream ruining the experience? Because it makes a flat surface, right? It turns us into proscenium designers. Even though the people I know who are best in this field are radically not from the proscenium tradition. Mm -hmm. And in fact, need to, and, and the thing that's interesting to me as a theater maker about all this um, stuff is that it's not screens. Ha ha, no editing, mm -hmm. no jump cuts. 
na 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 na. We work in that. That's our world, right? Um, and especially in non this relationship. And then also, how do we design those spaces so it's not this weird thing where I'm holding a mic, but it has no impact on the room, hmm. other than as a as a talking object, right? This mic is not for you, mm -hmm. right? I could whack it. Please I don't. won't. Um, and it, like, and the, all the rules that would make me not do that in a live show, which mm -hmm. is that it's awful for my audience, um, like I could get away with doing it. I don't, and I can't. I can't judge. Is my mic too close? Am I soft? All of those things. Mm -hmm. So how do we keep those interactions and the humans that are interacting as as a primary focus? And especially that's what to me, the, the most interesting parts of theater can bring into this. Mm. Isn't a like, this is our show, but you don't have to come, to no, we're really good at how humans interact with each other. Mm. Yeah. And we've spent thousands and thousands of years on that. Mm. And so let us use that part of our wisdom, not, not only our taping down and the, sh and the space needs to be cared for. Yeah. There's, a, there's a project that I'll, that I'll share that I don't necessarily have images to share. Um, but was presented in the last symposium, uh, Blue Hour, which was at the Prague Quadrennial, um, which used, uh, in addition to having, uh, so I'll have to sort of, sort of stage this a little bit. Uh, so the way that you came into the, the VR experience is that you were in sort of a circular pool, like a circular sandbox, so that uh, you were being tracked in the space and and the way that you were, uh, in, in, the, in and of itself, it would, took over a hockey arena. It was not dissimilar from the Fun Palace. It, it had some other artists working on it, so there were other things. It looked different, but same sort of idea, large space with a lot of time in it that people were able to figure out a lot of these things. And within it were contained a number of the four different VR stations. They all hosted the same thing. Um, but the way that you were introduced to them, they were mirrored these other pools that had other, other people performing in them. Some of them had water in them. Some of them had plants growing in them, etc. in this grid. And some of them were set aside for this uh, sand box. And you would uh, be invited into the sandbox. Like, as you were starting the experience, you'd take off your shoes, take off your socks, take, uh, plant your feet so that you had a bit of a grounding there. And then when you put on the VR, uh, the headset, after that, you were um, brought into a space that was mapped onto the space that you were just in. Mm -hmm. So it was relatively low resolution, but it was like the same massing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then brought into like the sequence of that VR experience started and ended in the same place where you were planted. And throughout that, there was a reference to that, that grounding that you had. So even though you were lifted above and moved around, it was always in reference to you are on a still platform. And you could feel the edges of it, where you got to the parapet, sort of like the edge of it with your toes. And that sort of like, I think about that a lot in terms of the care that somebody went into thinking about everything that you couldn't see and how that lined up with the internal, external mm. world blend yeah. that made it much more effective than it could have been a very compelling VR experience on its own. Mm. But I think that uh, I remember it much more because it, it, there was a scenography uh, surrounding it that I came into as an audience member. Uh, there. Yeah. Um, before we wrap, I didn't know, I, I used that to make my cross. <laughs> that was my, my, my monologue to make my cross back to the stage. Um, I'm wondering if you might highlight any, uh, taking us to the, to the break here, any, any <laughs> persistent myths, if you could highlight one persistent myth of, uh, of somebody coming into this way of working or this type of space that, and I'll offer an example. Uh, one, having worked in video-based VR a bit, is the expectations around resolution in the headset and what that's actually going to look like and what a camera can actually see. I mean, there's, yeah. I mean, there's so many myths or sometimes also realities. I mean, I think one of the big fallacies is to put the technology first instead mm -hmm. of the, the goal, the aim, the core, the user experience. And so like, okay, we want to use the technology and then design the experience for the technology instead of first thing of what should the actual experience be and then see like, well, I don't know, maybe it's not even HMV, maybe it's something completely different, maybe you don't need all of this technology. Mm -hmm. So it's so really questioning, okay, what technology is useful for what specific user experience and then remaining flexible enough to say like, well, maybe it's something else that I don't have an experience in, uh, so either we can't do it or we need to get somebody else to help out. 
So that's one of the things I run into when I teach my students. So one of the questions I tell them in advance, like, I'm going to question you. So if you, you could provide a similar experience without VR, just mm -hmm. with a nice video or acting or staging or anything like that, then uh, I won't accept it as a project in right. a VR course because it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So, and they don't necessarily like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it really helps them think about the affordance of the medium. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of playing off that, um, I think one of the myths in working in mixed or you know, virtual reality is that you need a lot of technology. And you really don't, right? Um, I give all my students cardboards, and a lot of them have not used one before, and it's amazing. They, they actually are quite amazed at what you can do with just a simple cardboard. And I also do like an exercise where you just build a world, um, a VR world in Photoshop, right? Because you just use the dimensions, and then you make that wrap around, and you can put that in the cardboard, and all of a sudden you have, you can do anything, right? Mm -hmm. in just using Photoshop. Um, so I think one of those myths is that you do have to have all the stuff, because mm -hmm. you I, don't. I mean, some of that, I think, comes really from the history. I mean, yeah. 20 years ago, whenever, well, it's long ago now that I started in VR, uh, that was not an option. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, cell phones did that not exist. That was just what you, <laughs> so, yeah. so one of the computers was literally $2 million just to be able to render that simple city that took years to create in VR because there was nothing automatic. Right. And I mean, don't get me wrong, the technology yeah, yeah. does make it so much easier than... Yeah not having it, right? Mm. But well, it's really, no, I think now we're at the point where we can care more about the user than the technology, which in a way is great. I don't yeah. have to reinvent and design uh, the physical aspects of the technology anymore. Now we can actually start using it and just hopefully trusting the Exactly. Uh, and every creators. year, like even things like Premiere, like all those tools that mm -hmm. we edit in are developing so much every year that now there's just filters. Now there's just like, oh, um, you know, 360 video apps that do well, that's, that's so many things. Like, like the example of the motion capture that we were doing before used to be something where you need a room of this size. Yeah. And now, now you like, can just put on a iPhone 10 and later <laughs> just does it. Like it's yeah. built into it. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. So. Um, my myth is I'll demonstrate um, the myth that uh, as developers of technologies, uh, anything that involves a mask is that we need to embrace uh, the, the idea, the, the reality that this is performative, especially in public spaces. And mm -hmm. to get away, uh, because I like the comment at the back about getting away from the trade show idea, mm -hmm. one way to do that is to acknowledge that this shifts someone, uh, everyone here, your perception of me right now in the moment, regardless of whether or not I accept that, oh, yeah, they're just in their own world, experiencing their own reality. Because like it or not, I'm not enclosed in a space in private behind curtains and having my own private VR experience. Now there are experiences like that, but, they're, but what's more prevalent in the field are open, publicly viewable, and I, and I was obsessed for uh, the, the last two years in unethically capturing people in VR who were being watched by other people, <laughs> not in VR, because I was just curious. And, and some people were like, you know, like that close, <laughs> uncomfortably close. And there, there's something to be said about in, in the, the tradition of the performative, that this is performative. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, as we continue to tally up our failures across projects over the course of the day, uh, we're going to go to lunch now. Hopefully, you will not fail in finding sustenance. Uh, and we will uh, return back for our, our afternoon panel at 1. Thank you okay. all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, do you want to announce where lunch yeah. is available on campus? Like different